Hello everybody, welcome to our webinar on making science happen in a two meter world. We hope this is going to be a stimulating and informative uh, couple of hours. And we have a great speaker lineup to, to make it happen. Just to introduce myself, so I'm uh, Jonathan Haig. My day job is to run uh, the science and technology organization for Unilever's home care division. So it's the bit of uh, the research and development organization that brings new technologies into the world and so we're busy trying to make bleach more effective and household cleaning easier and laundry faster and better and simpler those sorts of things with new technology uh, but i also chair the the chemistry council innovation committee and a number of the speakers that you'll hear from today are members of that innovation committee so on to the subject matter of of the hour well you know where we are um We've really been through a, a very, very severe lockdown, uh, perhaps not as severe in the UK as other places, but nevertheless, uh, a lot of our workforce has not been able to get into the office, not been able to get into the labs. And we're all wrestling with the challenge of how to get our output from research and development laboratories up to where it was, or even better than in the world before the pandemic struck. And so the uh, essence of what you'll hear today are, are people's efforts to, to do that, to maintain creativity, to improve creativity, to improve output in, in, a, in a context where really we can afford to only have very low densities of people working in our laboratories. So it's, um, it's a real challenge, but it is a new normal. And obviously in any scenario where we have a challenge, there is opportunity. There's opportunity to rethink and re revisit how we work, to reinvent how we work, to tackle these challenges and to come out stronger. Certainly within the chemical industry in the UK, half a million people are employed and a lot of those are classed as key workers in certainly in Unilever's context. Um, we didn't close our laboratories at all uh, because we were serving a, an essential business, uh, you know, in the cleaning industry. Uh, cleaning products were classed as essential and we kept our factories running and we kept our laboratories running to support the, for example, qualification of new raw materials, chemistries as we, we, we had um, supply impacts. So it, it, it's a really important subject, we think, and a great opportunity to do some collaboration together to figure out how we come out stronger. Just to introduce our speakers, so here, here they are. So we have Steve. Turner, Chief Scientist from SABIC, uh, Graham Cruikshank, who is the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer for one of the catapults, uh, the Centre for Process Innovation. Dr. Will Barton, who uh, is now Exec Chairman of Oxford Biotrans and Director of NITEC Solutions. Professor Andy Cooper, who uh, is a Professor of Chemistry at the um, University of Liverpool and uh, a part of ours in the Materials Innovation Factory. Dr. Adrian Atkinson, Founder and Chairman of Human Factors International. Uh, and Andy Burnett, who's the CEO of No Innovation. So these guys are gonna discuss the impacts um, of, of the two meter world in within the chemical in industry environment. And uh, when, when we've been through the line of the speakers, we'll um, have a facilitated Q and A session, which uh, means that you'll all be able to ask questions uh, through, your, um, through, through the software of the web webinar that we've got running here. So without further ado, let me uh, pass the baton to, to Steve Turner and let him take us through his experience from the SABIC uh, Industrial Lab point of view. Thank you very much, John. So thank you, everybody. I'm uh, here to talk about how we already manage risk in the laboratory environment. Ever since we started doing experiments, lab workers have been surrounded by a range of uh, hazards and risks in their working environment. I'm going to briefly summarize how over the uh, centuries and decades we've developed systems to control those hazards in order to be able to work safely. The key really is to follow a, a hierarchy uh, of hazard control steps. I mean, above every other possibility that you've got, it's important that all the employees and people working in the lab are trained to understand the hazards and risks in their workplace. The first thing that we try to do and the top of the tree of uh, control of hazard is to eliminate the hazard or risk. What you haven't got can't hurt you is the kind of concept there. But we also try to uh, put in engineering controls to control and, uh, uh, and contain the hazards. 
We put in procedures to be able to develop working practices that are safe. And we use PPE to provide some protection to people. I'd like to look in a little bit more detail at those individual elements of the, uh, of the hierarchy. So we start with elimination. As we said, the best thing is eliminating the hazard, remove the hazard altogether. And an example of that might be through taking a, a toxic solvent and replacing it with a benign solvent. Another alternative is to actually remove the personnel from the hazard itself. And we can do this, and we'll see some uh, examples of that later, of doing it through remote control. Another way is to actually control hazardous access to the hazardous area. So in other words, if we don't need to be in the environment, we shouldn't be in the environment. Looking in a little more detail at engineering controls, the purpose of these is to provide a physical barrier, ideally to contain the hazard, or alternatively, to separate the hazard from the people. Another thing that engineering controls can do for us is to actually provide 24-7 monitoring with no loss of concentration. The key about engineering controls is that they should be designed to operate with complete independence from the employees. They're designed to not need people to work properly. In addition to engineering controls, we actually use procedures. And these provide a rigor to the methods that we use for assessing and controlling hazards and risks. There's a whole range of these. In essence, they're designed to promote good safety behaviors in laboratory workers. They provide templates, they provide checklists to make sure that we don't forget things. Uh, and in particular, I want to focus on a particular aspect of actually uh, developing safe work methods. When developing a safe work method, it's important that we do it in a very detailed step-by-step -step method so that we consider at each stage what are the hazards that we're going to be handling, that we're going to be facing, the risks of interacting with that hazard. And through working in this step-by-step -step way, we get an understanding of how the work can be done safely. We need to consider many things. We need to consider not only the normal operation, but abnormal operations. So what actions should people take when things start to go wrong, when temperatures start to go up or pressures start to increase? What are the actual things that people can do to take back control? And we should also consider transient operations, for example, start up and shut down, so that at all stages uh, we have a full control of the hazards and risks involved. We need to consider the compatibility of all the materials we're using, understand how we're going to source them safely, how we're going to store them safely, and how we're going to dispose of them safely at the very end. We should consider all the hazards, chemical hazards and physical hazards, and of course, biological hazards. And historically, in my lab anyway, the biological hazards came in sample jars. In the future, they will also come in the guise of your work colleagues too. All of these things that we get out of the assessment, we use to create procedures and work instructions that help everybody in the laboratory to continue to work safely. But we should also recognize that no method can account for every possible deviation that might happen. So the employee must always feel empowered to say, this feels unsafe, we must stop now. Finally, we have PPE. Now, it should be very clear that PPE is always the last line of defense when all the other controls have failed. We should have engineering constant controls in place and we should have good procedures and methods for working. And the PPE is for when all of the other controls have failed us and we're having an incident or we've had some kind of release and it's there just as a last line of defense to protect the person. The PPE should be selected for the kind of hazard and conditions that we anticipate the user might need to face. And the user needs to be fully trained in its use and also understand its limitations because PPE protection is not 100% reliable. We must remember that. In summary, yeah, hazards in a, uh, to health in the laboratory, they're not a new concept. They've been around, as I said at the beginning, for as long as we've been doing experiments. The lab workers have been 
surrounded by a range of hazards, and coronavirus is a new hazard. It's quite possible that the coronavirus may need different control measures to the ones that we've been used to putting in place in our own laboratories. But nonetheless, I think that this hierarchy of control measures that we've developed will actually help us to be able to assess this new hazard and put in place the things that are appropriate for the work that we have to do. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and hand over back to John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Very sensible. Uh, nice talk. So I appreciate that very much. I think our next speaker is, um, is Dr. Graham Cruikshank from CPI. He's going to give us a point of view from the laboratory of uh, a, a national institution. Thank you very much, John. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all staying uh, safe and well. I uh, intend to speak about making science happen in a two metres world. There's a lovely little abridged summary there, which I hope you won't read, because I'm going to talk you through the learnings and the scenarios that we've experienced over the last three months, which have certainly been unprecedented in my career, where I've been responsible for a range of national facilities spanning electronics and industrial biotechnology and formulation, etc. Hence, a range of scales from very small scale lab work through to, frankly, pretty much full-fledged plant-scale work. All have things to be taken into account, some similarities, some differences, and that's what we wanted to share today, which I hope is of interest. Because, frankly, if I drive into the summary, as we've just heard, we as an industry are very, very, very familiar with risk management. It's what you do on day one, and in fact, it's what you do on every day when you go to work, where the one-on-one -on -one of it is assess the situation fully really understand your situation and be slightly careful of the one-size-fits-all type attitude. So in terms of removing the risk or engineering out the risk, as, we, as we've already heard from Steve, okay, reduce staff numbers on site to the minimum. I mean, it's pretty obvious and that's what people have done. In terms of managing the risk or the interceptions to the processes, the procedures, minimize crossovers, minimizing kit shares where we think there could be contamination, spread people out, scheduling better, by scheduling, actually that leads into my next point about embracing technology. Um, we're going to hear a couple of talks today where technology will be mentioned from very, very advanced robotics, which is absolutely fantastic. But equally down to the other, other end of the spectrum where we're embracing communication technology as we are now to avoid contact, automation technology for sample material and handling, or just simple scheduling technology, just simple electronic calendars that allow people to know what kit is being used by who, when, and therefore avoid those unintended crossover contacts where we know that um, contamination could be spread. And as we've just heard, the very last line of defense is PPE. And within PPE in this context of coronavirus, I'm, I'm talking about cleanliness actually as a core part of it, hand washing, sanitizers, appropriate way, use of lab coats and glasses. None of it's rocket science, it's pure common sense. However, we all know that common sense isn't that common. That's one of the problems. Hence, I've got this masks and question mark because we have to consider what are we wearing, why are we wearing it, and what unintended consequences might there be from us doing that. And mask is a case of point. So we've heard about 101, we've heard about removing um, contact if at all possible, but how did we actually go into this? How did we manage our way through it? And the basic premise of any plan is ensure you have a plan. Business continuity planning, I was very fortunate. I spent a long time just before this, um, situation emerged actually completing the business continuity plans within CPI, which was very timely. And I thank the, I thank a number of uh, 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 sources for that good luck. But you make your own luck. So I'm assuming that everyone on this call has a fully fledged business continuity plan and are refining it constantly because what we've learned during this plan is all the things that we wrote down were useful, but none of them were perfect because no one size fits all. And at the, at the heart of all of these plans are people. I know that Adrian will be talking later about the psychology of the situation we're in. And what we've learned is that actually many staff can successfully deliver their output from home. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm working pretty darn hard at the moment and delivering pretty robustly and feel good about that. And actually, it's amazing how IT works when the will is there. And um, we smile at that because we know we've got glitches, but actually IT does work when, when, when we need to use it. But what was critical for us was engaging with the people because people make or break situations. So engage the people, talk to your people, frequent webinars, frequent communications, and have staff-led programs. Because if the staff care about something and are impassioned about it, they will make it happen. That's actually the safety culture that Steve was talking about before here. And what underpins all of this? Well, kind of as John touched on, we in the chemistry producing and using industries, we truly are vital. We are actually key workers, whether we, whether we appreciate it or not, because 
as long as you're able to say that I'm making a decision which is purpose-based because it really mattered, that will make a difference. So within CPI, we continue to work through all of our facilities with skeleton on-site crews, primarily because it was a range of projects we were working on which were COVID-related, vaccines development, early stuff on the ventilator challenge, PPE-type programs, as well as supporting startups who had a range of new diagnostic and uh, treatment interfaces. And equally, within our role, our job is to help other SMEs who, let's be clear, may be struggling at the moment. Some of them might not survive this crisis. And anything we can do that help them increases in their chances of longevity is something that motivates me and the team that I work with. And that's what made us proud to work together. Now, slightly deeper dive. In terms of removing the risk, engineering out the, the issues, no one size fits all. Be very cognizant of the local staff needs. You might want to choose simple things like minimum staff on site every day. Oh, frankly, the rule we had was you only come on site if you're doing lab work. So if you can work from home, you will work from home. And I've said, but, and here's a little but, because I've just picked up very recently from colleagues in the chemical industries that they've identified a cohort of people for whom being at home has become a significant stressor. And it's not me worrying about homeschooling and, and, and. It's colleagues who actually are, work, are at home alone and weren't experiencing the stresses of family life around them, weren't experiencing the difficulties of juggling, juggling homeschooling and their job, but actually were suffering significant loneliness. So in fact, some organizations are welcoming a limited number of people back on site because for the greater good, it was beneficial that they interacted with a limited number of others in a controlled way. But let's assume you have a skeleton crew on site, needs to be an appointed person. Who is in charge? Who is making the calls on that day? And that has to be very clear and ensure that all safety measures aren't forgotten about. Your loan working procedures, your designated first aiders being on standby by rota. Don't forget those things just because you're working on it with a skeleton crew. Those risks don't go away. But one thing we have imposed is if you have finished your lab work for the day, you go home. You don't stay until four o'clock because that's when you feel you should go home. You go when the lab work is done. And then another tool I know a number of colleagues are employing is this notion of rotas or shift work, team A, team B, sometimes people are talking about it especially for critical capability maintaining teams. Why? Well, if you lose one person, you lose one team. You have to remember that in this COVID scenario, it's not about one person getting sick. That person's team are now by, by default isolating for a period of time. So how do you maintain your critical capabilities, assuming you've now decided you need to maintain them? And one of the solutions is have to have a team A and team B. So some fairly obvious stuff around managing the workplace, standardizing signage, demarcating areas, protection screens in front of reception, etc., cleaning materials readily on hand, all of that's obvious. Some of the slightly more less obvious but equally pertinent is, you know what, if you don't want two people sitting together, don't have two chairs together. So the two photographs there show a, a breakout area in our facility. We physically removed some chairs because people forget if you have two chairs side by side, you may accidentally sit in them. Well, don't do that, separate them out. Help make it easy for people to do the right thing in terms of corridors and stairs, only one person on a lift. Frankly, it's back to the old rule, stay left. I don't know about you, but I have had to explain to quite a few people why in the UK we drive on the left-hand side. But once that's been reminded in people, stay left. That allows us to create a, an area of separation between our colleagues. Safety procedures shared ahead of anyone coming on site, but staff confidence is key. It's all about the staff feeling comfortable in that scenario. So we can make it as safe as we can be, but how do they feel comfortable in that scenario? So for instance, optional things are now coming in. So that little blue item there is a door closer or a door key, or the little stylus on the end allows you to press the buttons on the printer or keypads, et cetera. And these were produced in house because after we'd finished making visors for the local NHS trust, we turned the 3D printers over to making these door keys for people who felt that that extra level of protection was something they needed. As we go into the lab areas, because it's labs I'm here to, to talk about specifically, in general, they're relatively open and relatively spacious, but what's really important is that the people in there are aware of the situation. Driving that situational awareness mindset is part of the safety mantra that Steve's talked about, i.e. look through the windows before you go in. If there's, if there's cleaning sprays there, use them. Make sure that you're using equipment which has been booked through calendars. Let simple technology help you. We've touched on that already. If there's an ante room, okay, only one person at a time. If there's PPE that's required, they must be used. This is not an excuse to not follow good procedures, good lab practices, and good hand washing practices, frankly. I don't know about you, but I can now sing happy birthday very, very well as I wash my hands. Gloves are interestingly, but then, then you need to be careful because what we didn't want to encourage were gloves being worn everywhere because some of you will know that increases the chance of contamination outside of a, of a key area. 
But message one was engage brain. Think about the scenario and the situation before jumping to solutions. This is one of our clean rooms. It's a class 9000 clean room in printed electronics. People are fully suited and booted and protected in this environment. So actually, within this workspace, we're feeling we're already very robustly protected. So if anything, if someone walked within two meters of another person, I'm not sure I'd be overly worried in this scenario. But that's not to be blithe about it. It's recognize what scenario you're in. These are what I'm calling two meter labs, which are probably slightly more familiar to, to most of you on the call, where people are, are distancing and isolating and separating as best they can, while still doing the job as best they can with, with a minimum crew on site. This is actually what I'm calling a greater than two meters lab, because whilst there's no one in this photograph, this lab is actually in operation. I'm not going to go into the details because Andy's going to elaborate much more down the line about the use of robotics. But the, the blue uh, device on the left there with the black and yellow tape around it is a high throughput formulation engine, the likes of which are, are available at places like the MIF in Liverpool, where solids, liquids and pastes can be mixed automatically from dispensers to create the hundreds of samples that you selected from outside of this room. And those samples are then passed on to some of the other bits of kit you can see in the photograph for testing. They're laying down films, they're testing toughness, they're testing color changes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point I'm making is in future, we can have labs with greater than two meters using automation as appropriate, flexible automation systems that augment people. They don't completely obsolete people, they augment people. So in future, how will we embed this, this two meter world? And for me, the answer is pretty obvious. Technology has its moment and we must embrace it. Communication technology is obvious, Teams, Skype, whatever. We're embracing it right now. You can all see that none of us have had to get on a train or drive hundreds of miles to come together. And yet we are communicating very effectively. Then we have this notion of smart and flexible automation. As scientists, we've, we've often embraced technology, but this is for materials handling, sample preparation, testing. Embrace these. The picture on the left-hand side there is from our biologics facility, and, and Sam is, is operating 65 different micro-reactors there, if you like. Each is brewing away a, a, a different product combination from our biologics facility. So the amount of people required to generate high quality, high detail, high value data is possibly changing. And now is the time to embrace that. The image on the right hand side is probably slightly less obvious. And this is where I'm talking about smart and flexible spaces. What you're looking at there is actually a lab in a bag, in a box, in a box. And what I mean by that is that white thing you're looking at is a, is a containment environment. And inside that is essentially a small pharmaceutical factory. And inside it, I've actually got two separate pharmaceutical lines in separate bags. So isolation areas within an isolation chamber, and that white box is within a larger room within the National Formulation Centre up in Sedgefield. So we can look to design our facilities to um, allow for multiple work streams in a confined area, but physically separated from each other. With that, I thank you all very much indeed, and I look forward to continuing this discussion afterwards. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, it's uncanny how real strong overlap with a lot of what Unilever's done to keep its labs operation. And I, I think this point about scheduling and planning has been really, really important. You know, we've um, and it's it's been the key to to actually getting the output up to where we want it to be, but without the um, the high density in the labs. It's uh, it's it's a transformed mindset for our scientists, but. For, for sure, it's made a big difference to individual productivity. Okay, so uh, we now move on to, to Dr. Will Barton, who's going to give us uh, a view from uh, the SME world. So over to you, Will. Okay, thanks, John. So I'm going to talk to you about handling this in a, an SME world. Um, the companies I work with are spin out some universities generally, and then typically less than 20 people. These companies working in different ways. Some of them are developing chemical products in laboratories, some using university laboratories, some using contract research organizations for scale-up, and then contract manufacturing organizations for ongoing manufacturing. We don't typically have our own manufacturing equipment on any one site. We're conducting collaborative our research and development programs with companies. We're conducting joint development agreements with companies and we're doing demonstrations with partner companies, all involving interacting with third parties. 
we're specifying novel reactor designs for construction by third parties. So we work with engineering companies and then we work with the clients on the commissioning and operation of the same. Again, difficult to do that um, without coming face to face at some point. And then visiting clients to understand their problems and offering proposals to develop solutions. So a, a wide variety of things to uh, pick up. And I'm gonna, I've picked out a, a number of common issues we've got across the companies and uh, and which we have to think about as we go forward. I, th I think the first thing that's very clear in um, it's true in the bigger companies too, but in in the small companies um, that I'm working with, we have a, a one or in some cases a few more investors in the company, and they've invested a certain amount on the basis that we meet certain milestones. And if we don't meet those, we die. We don't get more money just because we're going through COVID-19. So We've got, to, we've got to continue to work. We have continued to work um, in, to some extent. We've had a mixture of people furloughed, people working part-time and people working full-time to mix, meet the needs of the business as it is at any one time. So the first question we ask is who can work from home and when? And there are some people who can work from home for all the time. If they can do that, or most of the time, what are, what are the systems we put in place? Some of my fellow speakers have already mentioned some of the issues here, but having a proper place workstation at home, just like you have it at the office, is really important. Um, thinking about people's well-being, are they home alone all the time, as has already been mentioned, or are they at home with a family that needs a lot of attention and it's difficult for them to concentrate? Do they have the right amount of space? So we're thinking about those things in helping to make sure that people are in the right place. If people are home alone, then Maybe they're, more, maybe they're more in need of having team meetings online once a day, once a week. Um, maybe even there are people who would like to have, in one of the companies, we have a quiz night on a Friday night and um, whoever wants to get involved gets involved, just a way of socialising with people who are otherwise not meeting. So then you've got the people who need to go to the lab. The first question is, is their family safe and can they travel? So can they travel safely to the office? So when they get to the office, the laboratory, are the floor marking signage in place to help remind them of the procedures? Remember again, very small companies, so not a lot of people um, necessarily, not of levels of management. Do they need to be there all the time? So got some experiments to do, go in, do the experiments, go home to do the analysis and, um, and to write them up. It's, so in that case, is there a schedule to ensure there aren't too many people in the lab at the same time because different people in different teams might be making different decisions about when they want to be in? Or on the other hand, have we got to a situation where there could be one worker in on their own? Somebody needs to have a view of that and be taking a decision on how we handle each situation and either phasing work to get enough to get too many people so we don't get too many in the lab or phasing work so that we've got another lone worker. And then when we get to the lab and are doing our work, we have standard operating procedures, which have been written for all the standard procedures there. We need to take a look at the job safety analyses and do them again to take into account um, the COVID-19 restrictions. We might need new PPE. We need to make sure we've got it in stock if we haven't get it ordered. And then we, we're always looking for opportunities to make um, operations more efficient. So in the future, we might be looking, as has already been touched on, simple cobots so that one person can do a job with a robot rather than two people doing it. Or automation, which takes that even further. Now let's move over to going out to the lab or meeting with third parties. How do we meet third parties? Well, obviously, first off is can we use Teams, Zoom, Skype or something else? And are they secure for what we want to talk about? If we visit a client, be prepared, we've had this once or twice, to be asked for a self-certification piece of paper which says, I have no symptoms. You will find people asking you for that. We've updated our visitor procedures on site so that as well as hearing about distancing and the personal protective equipment requirements, then again, we're also asking people to certify that they have no symptoms when they arrive. Often we wait with visitor procedures until people arrive. We might, in some cases, need to think about letting people know the day before they come, or, or maybe even longer, what the visitors' procedures will be, because they may need to bring some PPE with them, because we might not have PPE for all our visitors. 
can we effectively con conduct demonstrations for clients? We typically introducing new equipment or new processes to people. Well, how much can be done by writing it, writing it, writing it up and doing good literature? Can we make videos to demonstrate what, what our equipment does or what our, um, what our processes do? If we're going to make those videos, have we got the equipment that we need to make those safely in the laboratory uh, environment as opposed to uh, in a conference room? And if we do have to go face to face, have we got safe, safe travel um, systems in place? Might be international travel, of course not at the moment, just we might have to wait two weeks before we can go back to work when we get back. But um, if we have to stay over, are the proper places to stay, um, where we can get food and where we can get a safe place to sleep? So all of those things being considered. Can we work with our contract research organisations or con contract manufacturing organisations on process scale-up? Defining what we can do remotely and what we can do on site is really important. But often thinking about contract research, when we're scaling up a process, we don't know everything. And actually witnessing some of the things that happen during scale up is really important in terms of thinking on about further scale up. And so there's nothing like being there. There are going to be times when that situation arises. We have to be there. We have to understand what our CRO's safety systems are and we need to make sure we can comply with them when we get on site. Once we've got beyond that and we have a process that we want to run to manufacture product for sale, then we should have our standard operating procedures nailed down. We shouldn't be having to visit the contract manufacturer unless we're in the troubleshooting mode. We ought to have that done and, and actually this is a real reminder for us to make sure we've got really good and precise standard operating procedures before we get to that point. So here, after what I've tried to do is, is go through a number of areas where maybe we can do a better job of what we do already, um, a bit more rigorous about the way we think about things, but we can put some procedures in place which will work well beyond the end of any constraints that might be around us in terms of COVID-19 and will make us a more efficient company in the future. Thank you very much. Stay safe and well. Thank you very much, Will. Um, I, I think I take from that that the um, small company or large company, the the issues there are exactly the same, aren't they? I mean, we and and the response is incredibly consistent. So um, thanks for that, Will. Um, we're going to pass over to uh, Professor Andy Cooper, who's going to talk to us about uh, an autonomous mobile robotic chemist, which uh, is quite an amazing thing. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, John. So I would like to talk to you today about our work on autonomous mobile robotic chemists. And this was work that we were actually doing before the COVID outbreak with the aim of making labs more efficient. But we think it's got something to offer now for operating labs in terms of uh, operating with some kind of social distancing. So what we've developed is a technology using mobile robots and effectively what we've done graham spoke about automation we've chosen to automate the researcher rather than the instrument so here you can see a split view and um, you can see the robot working in the lab and um, benjamin who built this system is controlling it actually from his uh, home so um this is an intrinsically remotely operable technology. And I think in some cases, it would be possible to imagine actually increasing your productivity maybe by a factor of 10 or more and having 10% physical presence. And I'll show you some um, statistics that would support that. So I won't go into the fine technical detail, but the robot navigates by itself using a combination of laser scanning and a force um, feedback routine and it's built to be dexterous and as you can see it's built to be approximately human scale that is it works in a lab which has not been uh, modified much so standard height benches and standard size instruments so one of the things about the design of this robot is we built it to work in a conventional or relatively conventional lab and it's therefore it can it has human reach 
It's also very modular, so you can expand it very easily. You can drop new instruments in, take instruments out very quickly. So unlike a lot of automation solutions, it's not hardwired. It's a modular technology, and most of the instruments in this workflow that you are seeing actually are commercial instruments with no modification, at least no hardware modification. So the system can do the things that you would do in a lab, the basic operations of solid dispensing, liquid dispensing. Uh, here you can see it's doing some reactions. These are actually photocatalytic reactions, and it can do measurements. So in the bottom right, um, the, the robot is operating a headspace GC, and you can just see just there it initiates it actually with a button push. Most of the control is in software, but if needs be, robot can open doors, push buttons, etc. again, like a human. And the way we designed it is shown here. So initially we prototyped this and you can see in the top right, um, we designed it to grasp things rather like you would with your fingers. And um, it does some things that you wouldn't be able to do with your fingers. It has seven degrees of um, uh, dexterity, which is more than you have in your hand. But um, at least I can't turn my hand through 360 degrees. Um, but it was very much built to mimic um, human operations. And I think you can see in the video there, it's loading up a sonication bath. So I'll show you just a 60 second video here. And this 60 second video was recorded about a year ago, it shows the robot doing a complete experiment in over 48 hours. So it runs rather fast. And I think the point to make here is it's not just running a scripted experiment, it's actually using artificial intelligence to make decisions. So it will um, make and measure 16 examples, then decide what to do next. And if the um, decision is at 3 a.m., then it makes the decision without waking me up. So you can see here, um, it's dispensing liquids, solids. The thing in the, in the foreground is the photolysis reactor. Um, you see now the lights, uh, well, the, the sun has gone down, it's running through the evening, the sun comes up in the morning, and so on. And it runs batches of 16 samples, and it's totally autonomous. Um, we're not telling it what to do, it's ma actually making choices. And in this particular um, routine, it measures around, makes and measures around 200 samples in the course of 48 hours. So. The next slide actually shows some of the data coming off the platform, and I won't talk too much about the chemistry, but this is a, a 10 component formulation problem for a catalyst problem. So it's choosing from a, an array of 10 catalyst, potential catalyst components, and that describes a, a space of about 100 million possible reactions that you could carry out. And what it's doing is using a Bayesian search algorithm to search that space, so it's operating independently. And you can see here the data coming in real time off the platform. The, the, the dotted horizontal line is the baseline catalyst activity. And this experiment runs over eight days. And by the end of the experiment, the robot has found catalysts, which are about six times better than the baseline where we started entirely by itself without any input from us. So in the course of that experiment, um, the robot makes and measures about nearly 700 samples. It makes 319 moves, six and a half thousand manipulations. It works for 172 hours out of a possible 192. So even more than, than I work as a chemistry professor. And it travels a total distance of two point two kilometers, which is 23 times the height of Big Ben. So it actually moves around uh, a lot. I think it also transfers about four kilos of material throughout the experiment. And in the course of that, it finds a catalyst, which is six times better than, um, than we had in hand. It turns out to be a four component formulation. So out of the 10 possible components, the robot selects four in a particular ratio as the best. And the time scale looks like this. So when we were doing these experiments before without automation, um, typically it would take a researcher about half a day to set the thing up and, and, and then it was sampled 
either manually or automatically. So effectively, you could do one sample a day, and it took about half a day. That doesn't work very well with social distancing if you have to go into the lab every every day. But in the experiment I showed you, you set it up. That takes about a morning for a, a researcher or technician to set the thing up. So it takes about three or four hours, then it runs autonomously for a week or 10 days or potentially even longer. Um, so the acceleration there in terms of the researcher time spent is something of the order of 2000 in this particular case. And uh, you could imagine working even one day on and 10 days off. So that could help with, um, obviously help with the phasing of teams and, and uh, rotors, which were discussed earlier. So the example that I showed you was catalysis. It was photocatalysis. You could equally imagine the same type of thing with thermal catalysis, but we think it has much broader usage than catalysis. Um, we see scope for pharmaceutical research or also small scale pharmaceutical manufacturing, perhaps. Um, biotechnology, polymers, we've already started to do some work with inorganic materials. Um, formulations, this is a catalyst formulation, but it could be a paint formulation in principle or a home and personal care formulation. And we're also doing some work on organic synthesis. So we don't have all of those tools in hand at the moment, but in principle, with some caveats, if a, if a human can operate it, then in principle, a human could with the right design and with the right software um, and hardware. And actually, very recently, we formed a company, Mobotics, where our aim is to help um, organizations with, with, with implementation of this technology. So with that, I will um, thank the organizers. Thank you for listening and pass back to John. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, very inspirational stuff. And uh, I think we, we really do have a bit of a glimpse of the, the future there, which uh, yeah, clearly you're going to be very excited to work with Andy on this. Um, and um, ho hopefully Mobotics will, will actually be a very successful spin out. Um, Okay, so we, we changed tack a little bit now, um, and we're going to talk about the psychological aspects of working in a two-meter world. Uh, so we hand over to Dr. Adrian Atkinson, who's the founder and chairman of Human Factors International. So over to you, Adrian. Thank you very much, uh, John. And uh, I would like just to introduce myself, but I'm Adrian Atkinson. I'm not a chemist. I'm a psychologist. And uh, talking about psychological aspects of working in a two meter world. So the first, there are three aspects to it that are the key ones that we're going to cover. First is the behavioral adaptation to a two meter world. That is, how do we get people to behave differently and remember to behave differently uh, in a consistent way? Secondly, if people are working remotely, how do we uh, make sure that that working remotely is productive and that they are looked after, that they are not stressed by it, etc. So we have a look at that. And then thirdly, uh, there is a very interesting possibility that the intranet could become even more important than it has. It's uh, not met, not every company has got a a fully functioned intranet. So the behavioral adaptation to a two meter world is to answer the question, does the person understand the requirements and the importance of the message that's coming across? How do we best get the message across of how to work in a two meter world? Well, the first thing is when we uh, provide information when we to give get the message across, we need to do it in three ways. We need some written information, we need numerical information and pictorial. Now, frequently all we get is written. And it's important to have those three. Why? Because many people are very uh, prone to understanding written, but not the other two. Same for numericals. Some people are superb at numerical information 
and working with it, but not interested in written or pictorial. And the same for pictorial. And sometimes there are people who can really have a strength in all three areas. So whatever we do, when we're getting the information across, we should have posters up. We should have things on the uh, uh, on the internet. We should have things on Peter's computers, people's com computers, um, which are all three of these formats, uh, and this will help people to get uh, more understanding about the requirements and their importance. Feedback of success and failure is important as well. The way we change behavior uh, is to give feedback to people, a reward uh, for doing it well, a six, something which says, well done, that's great. And failure means we need to be able to talk to them, get them to understand why not to do that in the future, etc. And you need weekly updates of this, not just, I, I'm not talking just about the individuals, I'm talking about teams and I'm talking about organizations. The fourth thing is, we've already said, Graham has suggested you remove chairs from uh, beside people. The layout of the working environment is very important. That's going to change. It has changed already. But can people see and talk to each other from a distance? Is there a way that people can still feel part of the social scene? So we've got to try and keep the social aspects of life going as well. So interestingly, who will keep to the rules? And here we have to look at personality and there are particular types of personalities uh, who are very rigidly keep to the rules. And there are other types who will actually not, well, they'll break the rules. They will appear to break the rules, but they just will ignore them, etc. These personalities, for example, an expedient person is someone who cuts corners to get results. And those corners can be not require not part of the requirement so they will go down go and sit beside somebody close or stand beside somebody close when that is not in the the rules imaginative people are rather more interesting they are highly imaginative and you get them in research organizations uh, they will just forget about the rules they will just be thinking about other things and these other things will take up their whole uh, mind or, and they will do things which are really not well valued by the people around them we have values uh, we all have values and some people have one of particular value high need for autonomy they like to work and make decisions on their own. And these people uh, may actually, because they make decisions on their own, they make decisions which are not accepted by the rest of the team. And therefore, they can break the rules in that way. And there are people who have a low need for security. Now, why they break the rules is because they are risk takers. And uh, these risk takers, I, I, great one is Elon Musk. He's a classic example of uh, a, a low security risk taker. Um, but there are lots of people who are of this type, low security, and we they have to think in a different way. They have to be considered in a different way. The other one is gender. Is there a difference between male, male, and, male and female? And there is very little research in this area at the moment um, in terms of the lockdown and uh, the, these change of rules. Uh, but what we do have is one that came out about two weeks ago, uh, which suggested that uh, of teenagers and 
young men up to the age of 25, 50% uh, of young men and only 25% of young women breach the lockdown rules. So there, there is a change, a, a difference between the genders, um, but both sides, there is always a, both types, as there's a possibility of men and women breaking the rules, but that comes, that comes out of the personality characteristics more. Uh, highly anxious people, they tend to keep to the rules. They're worried about catching the virus for themselves, but they're particularly worried about letting others down. They don't like to let other people down or appear to let them down. So we now can move on to tasks. Um, different tasks that we're asked to do in these different this different situation when working remotely. So we're going to cover working remotely and looking at what is it that we need to do. We need to train and support people uh, when working remotely. Problem solving is a, a pretty typical task for many people in their job and that requires people to think through with other people with different knowledge and skills. Creative need to share and explore ideas with others. Coping with uncertainty. We, who can help to reduce the uncertainty? We need to contact people. We need to get in touch with people to be able to help each other in these areas. Under pressure, uh, for example, speed, the need to do something quickly, we may need support. That is more people involved in the task and to check decisions. And teamwork itself, needs feedback, praise, or critical appraisal from other team members. We need to do these things in a very team way, and we need to think of how can we help other people, not just how can other people help us. Working remotely, uh, we can move to um, individual differences. Who is, what, what are the kinds of people who best suit working remotely? And we have uh, uh, the first personality characteristic is introversion versus extroversion. And introversion is somebody who is very much keeps to themselves, not terribly interested in interacting with other people, etc. And you might think they were perfect for working remotely, but they, the extreme introvert breaks the the other rule, which is keep in touch with people, help other people, get in touch with them and ask them, can I help you in any way, etc. Introverts tend not to do that. Extroverts are the opposite. They are people who are driven by environmental conditions and things going on around them, interacting with people. And the extreme extrovert just, <coughs> just tends to get terribly excited about everything and interacts with people uh, for no good reason sometimes. And uh, with introverts and extroverts, what we can say is that the extreme introverts and the extreme extroverts are le le least, least are appropriate for working remotely. The, the ones who are in the middle are the people who are going to cope with working remotely best. We also have a self-confidence and apprehensiveness and there we can see that uh, um, self self confident people um, will just get on with the job and believe that they can cope with all the pressures, etc. But the apprehensive person will actually not break the rules and will be concerned to do the right thing. Uh, and so they're going to be a strength in working remotely. People focused and task focused. Task focused people um, are get on with tasks, but may overlook the need to check with others. Uh, people focused need interactions, talk about feelings and emotions, so they miss out uh, on remote when they are doing remote working. And collaborative, independent people. Uh, there are people who are very collaborative and. Uh, 
like to interact with other people and they need they they can be very good if they can communicate with lots of people in when they're working remotely independent people uh, they like to make their own decisions and they don't check with other people as to how well they're doing then the last part of working remotely is the leadership styles in which we're saying what do the managers how do they need to change in the, in working remotely and the these have to change in terms of uh, the type of leadership style they have directive uh, managers t just tell what to do and expect obedience that's probably just a bit too strong but they have no engagement with the person very much they just say this is what's got to be done and so on then there's the inclusive collaborative style and this is the best style for managers working remotely so they uh, mu must get engagement uh, they've in, they will contact people and ask them what do they think about this we've got to make this decision etc how do we go about doing it um, and we'll include the people who are working remotely in the process of decision making permissive style is one in which um, they allow the team members to self-supervise uh, that is it isn't appropriate for remote working the last part for work working remotely is the culture a set of values attitudes and beliefs that's a culture there are two types of cultures that mainly we can talk about as there are many ways of cutting up culture but there's a need for a balance between behavior and output culture behavior culture is where the uh, organization says this is how you should behave this is what you should do with other people this is how you should interact and so on because this is the way that we will get the jobs done and we will succeed so it's very much behavior driven uh, a good example of a company like that is starbucks very very behavior uh, culture controlled output control cultures are companies which just say what we how we measure each other in terms of performances how much how much result do you get what's your result and the output control come what we need in working remotely is a need a balance between behavior and output uh, interesting the work we've done with uh, remote workers uh, five uh, as issues came up they are career progression participation innovation conflict management those four have come up time and time again as important things that we have to remember to help remote workers with um, the last one have a buddy link this is one that they frequently say that when they have a buddy link it's a great success so just like aqua sub aqua diving you have somebody who you can just call at any time just about and uh, just to be able to talk to them about how things are going frequently that allows some gossip to come in gossip is uh, very important in organizations and it's uh, it's lost in most remote working situations the last thing that I would mention is I would recommend really a strengthening of intranet the social communication uh, that it provides and it provides information so that employees can perform their roles but it also uh, it's vital for colleagues to, to be able to communicate with one another uh, connect engage and actually feel part of a bigger organization feel an understanding of what we should do what we shouldn't do the internet is 
fantastically good at building and maintaining a culture in an organization. So I will finish there and hand over to Andy, please. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I think uh, it's absolutely fascinating uh, talk. I think the uh, probably just one comment from my side. I think we've seen um, through Unilever a, an incredible amount of communication from the Unilever leadership, uh, the executive that runs the company. And, um, I, I think some of those habits that have been developed, some of the, the com communication and connections are, are things that are absolutely going to survive uh, post the the COVID crisis, it's, uh, it's just been a real improvement in the, uh, the sense of connectivity in the company. So, um, yeah, fascinating talk, thanks. So, uh, can I just um, ask people to get thinking about questions? We've got one more talk from Andy Burnett, who's going to talk to us about creativity in this new world. But in the meantime, please also do start to put some questions onto the, the system so that we can start to think about answering them. Over to you, Andy. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, or whatever time zone you're in. Um, I want to just briefly offer some thoughts about um, creativity within this new environment. Now, for the last 20 years or so, my colleagues and I have been focused on uh, looking at ways in which we could enhance and augment the creative processes within research environments and most of the time we end up working in places like this and uh, I was thinking about this as I was putting this together and I thought it almost doesn't matter what the topic is they always look like this it could be synthetic biology it could be behavioral medicine I have a feeling this one might have been behavioral medicine but the point about it is this sort of way of collaborating on idea development and the perhaps the front end of your process is currently no longer uh, possible but I want to come back to something that Jonathan was saying earlier which was to take upon ourselves collectively the challenge of saying how might we come out of this even better than we were before and obviously in this context even better is thinking about how might we behave in ways which are even more um, supportive for creativity so i want to offer just a few thoughts uh, around this now we have been experimenting with um, engaging in virtual creative practices for a long time. So even though the slide I just showed you with people sitting around tables is how we had typically worked. For about the last decade, we've been thinking about how might we accelerate uh, the process of scientific innovation and what role does creativity play in this. And I want to offer you this um, very simple, but we found a very useful model, which was in fact from the 60s by a researcher called Mel Rhodes, and he went looking for definitions of creativity and found four different ways of thinking about it. Now, I've altered this ever so slightly where it says environment. In the literature, it actually says press, but I find environment is a, a, a more accessible term. So we tend to use this model of thinking about what sort of people and how do they want to work together? What do we define as a creative output? What processes might we want to use? And what sort of environment is supportive for creativity? And we use that in all of our work. But when we were thinking um, more specifically about the current pandemic, and we were saying, OK, what are we going to lose and what do we gain from this? We realized that probably it was fair to say that product and process we're not actually going to change that much. Granted, the timing on your brainstorming might be elongated or it might be chopped up in different ways, but the underlying process was going to be the same and you were still trying to develop new kinds of synthetic bio devices or whatever the challenge was. And so we really started focusing more on what might we understand and enhance from a person and environment perspective. And I just wanted to offer a couple of examples around this because when we're talking about people and we're talking about this new, not so much a two meter world, but perhaps a 200 kilometer world, it's useful to think about pencils. Now, there are a whole collection of uh, situations and I think some of the earlier presentations where we were talking about lab security, we're really looking at the process uh, through which we could 
if not guarantee, then at least to encourage that safety procedures would be followed and that it was very helpful to actually have people who are behaving in a consistent way. That's hugely useful. I don't want to be on a flight with a pilot who goes, you know what, this time I'm going to try something different with the landing. You go, no, nope, just follow the process for this. But when we're actually trying to generate new and unusual ideas, it's incredibly helpful to have as diverse a range of participants as we can possibly get. Now, we normally manage to do that in face to face events. But when we open up to a virtual environment and when we can really get people to work effectively in this, we have a wonderful opportunity of engaging people in these processes that simply we hadn't been able to do before. So I would like to encourage you to think about in a 200 kilometer world, who could we engage that we haven't been able to easily engage before? An example of this is uh, ARIS is a National Science Foundation funded project that um, was designed to uh, encourage what they refer to as broader impacts. In essence, thinking about how do we take the benefits of research and disseminate them to a wider community. They have been holding face to face conferences for a number of years, and they typically had 150, 180 participants, something like that. They came to us and said, quick, we need to convert and we have about a week to do it. And um, we were able to do this. But what I found most interesting was we managed to get the attendance up to, I think, around about 270 people, many of whom would not have been able to be involved before. This is an important step. If we can embrace this and if we can find new and better ways of doing this, we can get more people involved in the conversation that we've had previously and a wider range of them. And we know that this supports creative outcomes. Going back to the Mel Rhodes model and just thinking about the environment for a moment, um, I want to come back to uh, what Will was saying earlier about having the right technology for this. When we first started, looking at virtual collaboration, uh, people were very skeptical and they went, no, you talk over each other and the sound is rubbish and that sort of thing. And of course it was. And part of the reason for that was people just didn't invest properly in actually having the equipment to be able to have an enjoyable and essentially uh, an experience where the technology became invisible. But you can, and it's not difficult and it's not particularly expensive you can actually make a physical environment which is far more effective than what you would be doing in a cubicle in a beige building in actually i won't name a city because it's not fair but we all know that there are places where you go yeah that environment isn't particularly exciting we can do better than that but the environment is not just the physical side it's a sort of hygiene factor it has to be easy enough but we've also got to think about the psychological environment. And there's a researcher called Euron Ekval who did some work a while ago now, but really looking at the factors within an environment that produced a creatively conducive space. I've got one item here in red, and I highlight that only because all of the other items are basically the more you got of it, the more likely you were. Uh, to be able to get a creative output. And Ekval makes a distinction between conflicts and debates. And this links back to what Adrian was saying a moment ago uh, about the, the difference here is a debate is an exchange of points of view with the intention of getting a better output. A conflict is in essence an unproductive uh, debate. But I think this model that Ekval had, had put forward is interesting for us to think about. Uh, again, going back to some of Adrian's points about differences in personality, um, one might say uh, within a virtual environment, how might one develop a, uh, a, a context that supported playfulness and humor on the understanding that your tolerance for playfulness and humor may be different from your colleagues. And I think this, again, gives us an important opportunity to actually do better than we would do just in a face to face environment. We can have nuanced differences. You can experience a space in a different way. So there are models, simple models, but quite effective that we can use to think about 
in this environment that we are now in and are likely to stay in for a while, how might we organize it in order to maximize our creativity? And our experience so far has actually been we can do remarkably well in virtual environments. In, in my own organization, we've had the opportunity to do a number of direct experiments where we're comparing face to face with virtual and the output is essentially similar. The experience is different and there are pros and cons to it, but the output is still the same. And I wanted to offer, just as a final slide, one thought on this. Uh, this happens to be a virtual reality environment where I snapped a shot uh, in this. VR uh, at the moment has always uh, ha been seen as something sort of rather gimmicky. If you haven't had the chance to experience it, I encourage you to try it, not because it's necessarily ready for prime time now, but because it gives you a glimpse of the future. And our experience with using it is you get a much stronger sense of presence than you do through this sort of 2D flat uh, video conferencing world. So there are tools and approaches that are emerging right now that I think could really change the way we collaborate in a 200 kilometer world. And I come back to Jonathan's point. Let's aim to do better when we come out of this rather than just go back to normal. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Lots of examples I've been involved in already of trying to be creative through Zoom and Teams. Um, and I think people are understanding that it's different, but it can be done. So very much resonate with what you're, you're saying there. Um, so uh, I think. Um, if I've got my planning right, we should be starting to field questions to the speakers. That, uh, and please do contribute questions. Uh, um, we, we haven't got very many just yet, um, but we have a few to get going with. So I, I think first off, start a question for Andy Cooper. How easy is it going to be for an SME to use the sort of technology that you've described? So we'll hand that to Andy. I think there are two questions there, I guess, is how easy is it to use and, and maybe what might it cost? Um, so we're working on a front end software where in principle it's very easy to use. In fact, the workflow I showed uh, just in the, in the talk, you, you press a run button, you don't need to know any programming, you don't need to know any robotics. So really it's a question of rolling that out across more applications, but I think it could be usable by SMEs, but there is some software and hardware development to do first i guess the, to, to engage we engage through your spin out company do we yeah that's right and um and uh, yeah if anyone has any specific requirements or projects or ideas to discuss absolutely get in touch with me and yeah. we can talk about it. the um there's one for me actually i've seen here which is do you think the current crisis is also an opportunity to rebuild the fast moving consumer goods industry in a sustainable matter, manner, and if so, how so? So uh, I think the first point we make as, as Unilever here is that the, um, you know, we, we, the, the COVID crisis is here for a while, but the environmental crisis is, is even bigger uh, and isn't going to go away. Um, we absolutely know from talking to the UK government that um, there's a very, very strong sense that whatever recovery takes place, is done in a, a way that heads us towards a sustainable future. And so very much the, the messages we're getting from U UKRI, Innovate UK, I mean, Graham might want to say a word on, on this, is that um, the investments for the future will be in a sustainable way. And so, you know, we will play our part in that. Um, I mean, just from Unilever's perspective, uh, I think we're um, increasingly looking to accelerate the uh, end of non-circular plastic we're looking to ensure that we are working with the chemical industry at large to source renewable ingredients uh, with a lower carbon footprint. So a lot of our ma major suppliers are investing in renewable chemistry, um, but it's not an easy thing to switch the petrochemical industry into renewable overnight. So we have to accept that it will take some time, but certainly the the sense I'm getting and the, the the environment I'm seeing in the UK is very positive on that front 
uh, we'll continue to champion it. And uh, within the Chemistry Council um, Innovation Committee, we're, we're working on a sector deal with UK government. And uh, a good chunk of that sector deal is um, re related to sustainable materials for consumer goods. So I hope that answers your question, Katie. Um, let's see if we, what else have we got. Is gossip always positive? I think that's a good question for Adrian. Well, obviously, gossip sometimes is not positive, but it can be a very important aspect of an early warning system for people. And uh, it is something that humans are very, uh, well, more, some humans are very involved in. So, yes, sometimes it is, but maybe the part of the culture is to say, please don't gossip in a way that is negative. Try and try and be positive. But gossip is straightforward things uh, about emotional things very often. Um, and not so much to do with factual things. So, not an easy answer. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have a perspective on that? I, I think that one of the uh, the aspects of gossip is that it tends to fill a vacuum. Um, so, as Adrian was saying, it's a, it's an alert to you if it's happening that that people are feeling a need for some more information that they're missing. I think. Yeah. Yeah, just to close, I, I think that's very fair. The point I tried to make uh, when I was presenting was you can't communicate too much at a time like this, because if you don't communicate, you will leave a vacuum. And in a vacuum, the negative elements of gossip will proliferate and we will end up catastrophizing. Some, some people could end up catastrophizing unnecessarily. Therefore, to keep everyone on that positive footing that Adrian's touched upon, it's incumbent upon us or other leaders to make sure that there's clarity, communication, and positivity. Because, But equally, people do need to let off steam every now and again. So finding a mechanism to let people vent is just, is just useful. So I think there's, a, there's an interesting related um, question to that, which is what can we put in place to replace the copy room chat where employees keep up to date with what their peers are up to and brainstorm issues together in an informal setting. So it, it's directed to, to me, uh, but I, I actually think probably other people are uh, equally well qualified to put some thoughts in place on that. I mean, it might be worth um, SABIC or, or CPI saying what they've done to try and keep that alive. I'll go first, Steve, actually. Um, so so in, ter in terms of... Uh, the basket of activities that are required. Absolutely right that, that there is a need for everything on that spectrum from social uh, fun interaction that replaces the me meeting you at the coffee machine and just talking about the relative uh, catastrophes that our football teams have been having through to the other end of the spectrum, which is started off with us talking about the relative football teams catastrophes they were having, but then morphed into a more constructive business building, what if, couldn't we consider type conversation, and, and there's the whole spectrum. And therefore, we, we've been we've learned that there's a power of organic development of tools. So some individuals have stood up, said, I want to run a quiz. I want to do a pub quiz on a Friday. We've actually got a pub called the, the Staying In INN and, and you know they have with, with virtual meetings and vir that's fine that's great and some people like it some people embrace it but you can't mandate it you can't force it on people but but what we've observed at the kind of other end of the spectrum is enabled by this exactly this I mean th this screen that I'm looking at with these people and all I had to do was click a button to get them I, I, I actually mentioned I think I'm working harder now than ever before that probably implies I never used to work very hard but the notion is you are constantly available almost to people. And it's that it's that it's that click. Oh, hang on, the little button's green. I'll just drop them. We know, John, you got five minutes. Can I talk to you about such and such? So, actually, this this accessibility of people in this face-to-face -face medium, because it is face-to-face, -face, has, has has sparked so many conversations that I'm aware of. That actually, if anything, I'm now in a position where I've got so many people coming with so many ideas. I'm finding it hard to kind of prioritise things that we can tackle, because what I've got is a condition of people desperately wanting to make a difference, people desperately wanting to invest more energy, which is great, we just need to harvest, harness it. Uh, uh, Stephen, uh, similarly, similarly in SABIC, we've, uh, we've got relatively informal things. So people used to typically gravitate to the coffee machine at around 10 o'clock in the morning. And so what they've done now is we've 
we've set up a, a 15 minute window where there's a where there's a meeting where people can just join that with their coffee and just have a general 15 minutes catch up with people yeah there's no pressure to do that but if you want to and you're available you just drop in similar kind of thing but uh, my particular job role is a global role so this is virtual world is really my world yeah and uh, one of the benefits, if you like, I've seen with the, with the lockdowns in all the different countries is that it used to be me joining a meeting room of 20 people. And it was difficult for me to break into the room, but now they're all isolated in their own homes and everybody is actually interacting on that level. And you're quite right, Graham. What, one of the things that we've seen is that people are much more willing to reach out virtually and contact people via Skype or whatever system that you have. Uh, and that's been quite positive. And I hope that actually that inclusiveness that people have, have created as a result of this continues to happen in the future. Jonathan, there's, um, there's another thought related to this. Um, Nesta, the National Endowment for uh, Science, Technology and the Arts, um, did an experiment a, a few years ago, which we've also used, which um, if you've worked in uh, medical research, you'll know the phrase RCT for randomized clinical trials. And they, they developed the idea of uh, randomized coffee trials, um, mm. which, uh, which was essentially within the organization about getting uh, unusual pairings uh, of people to go and just chat. Um, and I liked the idea, not just because it was funny, um, but we started using that in a slightly different way where we would take people's areas of expertise and we wrote a, a, a simple sort of genetic algorithm to look for maximum differences between people and then invite them to go and have randomized coffee trials. Now, um, we used to do that just face to face if we were working within a, a university, but we now run them virtually. And, uh, and it's fascinating for a subset of people how much they enjoy this. So I don't want to suggest that everyone wants to do this, but the chance to meet people who have an interest in whatever it is that you're convening a meeting around, but um, as different from each other as they can be, um, many people find quite exciting. And I, I emphasize this because meeting at the coffee machine has probably some geographical biases in it in that you might be on the same floor you might be in the same building if you go slightly further than that and say no we can do better than just chance now what can we generate you really start to see some fascinating uh, conversations emerge organically okay thank yes thank you um andy uh, th there's um there's a couple of other questions that are coming through that I think um, are probably worth airing. So <laughs> what one is, can you really prepare for the uh, completely unexpected? That might be one for Steve. Well, the completely unexpected, clearly not. Yeah. But uh, I think we rely to some degree on our expertise to understand the nature of the kind of hazards that we're likely to face uh, and approach them. But that was one of the reasons why I said, uh, even with when you've thought it through and you've done all your dry runs uh, for any particular uh, practical method that you're going to put into the laboratory space, you cannot predict absolutely every possible outcome and how things may go wrong. So you do need to have that, in, you know, the safe, safe way out option. Yeah, You always need to have that. And the people who are doing the work need to feel empowered to be able to take it. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have a, a perspective on that, Will, perhaps? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, if we working in a world where we're spinning out technologies from universities, you can get internal surprises as well. You know, you, you try something and it just doesn't work. And uh, so what are we going to do? You know, the company's future is dependent on this. So what do we do? And and so you, you you're almost preparing yourself to prepare for, to, to be able to handle the unexpected. And um, it, it's actually no different when you get when that unexpected thing comes from outside. Um, I, you, a customer you expected um, would be really interested in the product, suddenly find it doesn't work for them. Wow, I've been sp spent my last six months trying to get that 
product working for that customer and it doesn't work. So, yeah, um, and, and all of those are situations you can't control. So being prepared for them is just living in a world where you expect surprises and when you get them, you deal with them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I think of the, of the number of, um, uh, let's call it events that have happened over the past few months that have required uh, an immediate and instant change of direction. I mean, there's myriad really, you know, supply, supply of chemicals running out, uh, you know, the, the, the panic buying that led to uh, immense demand in some areas of the business, you know, that sort of thing. It's all, um, you know, you've just got to figure out how to be agile in, in response. I, don't, I think that's a, a great trait that a number of, sort of, a number of, sort of, sort of we, we, we've seen them, the companies at their very best in being able to respond agilely. Yeah. Okay, a uh, couple more um, questions. Uh, there's, there's one here about, um, there's probably two related questions. One is, uh, do, do you think companies will spend significant money in making COVID adaptations if the virus is seen as a temporary situation? Um, so uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Even as a temporary situation, we have to invest uh, in um, making our workplaces safe. Although I, I think probably the, the sorts of investments like creating a wholly robotic mobile laboratory a, a, a little way off yet. But I, I think the what we're finding is generally the, um, you know, the acceleration of changes in ways of working do demand investment. And actually, they're not going to be temporary. Some, some of the good habits, some of the good practice will absolutely stick. Um, so the virus might be temporary, but the innovations that it's it, uh, pushed us into making are, are going to stay. I'm sure all those people are saying. Yeah, yeah I, I think you've heard that message from a few of us in our talks, that uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's here to stay. But there's um, I, the, the question related to that is, um, the gist of it, it's a long question, so I'll, I'll try and paraphrase it. We, we've all reacted very fast to keep up with regulation and guidelines. However, there remains a persistent feeling of the temporary nature of the measures. Um, and, and in essence, do we think we should be continuing with these measures as part of a long-term future? Please discuss. <laughs> so um, it is an interesting question, isn't it? So I, I don't know who wants to put that hand up and have a crack at that one. I'll start us off, if, if, if you don't mind, John, because I'm not entirely sure what measures the, 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 the questioner is referring to specifically, but, but a point I, I, I tried to touch upon was there is no one size fits all. And this notion that a simple decree of do X or do Y and everything is sorted, I'm not entirely sure I believe that's the case. I think very early on in our immediate disaster intervention phase, we all lined into, uh, fell into line and followed, the, followed any guidance because of a major fear factor. As we move through that, we then need to become much more situationally aware, is the phrase I tried to use. And I deliberately chose some photographs of some people in incredible levels of PPE in one environment through, through to others with, with no people at all. So it's up to us to use not common sense, because I joked about common sense not being common, but us to use best data, knowledge, and experience in each situation that we come up to to define the right solution for our people, for our business, for our programs to, to move forward on. Because one of the truths is we cannot just hold our hands up and say, we surrender, we're not going to do anything. That, that we, we can't. But equally, we can't walk into it blithely or blindly or with with, with so much cocksure arrogance that, oh, I can't be harmed, as, as um, uh, uh, Adrian was, was talking about earlier. You know, it's, like, it's that mindset of that middle ground, that collaborative mindset that's being aware of the situation, that's thinking about the positive, i.e. what can we do, not the what we can't do all the time. And that's that's just that's just a mature business, a mature organisation and a mature mindset that, that I think we need to deploy. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's call it then. I, I think unless there's Somebody out there with another burning question. Do I need to show these last couple of slides um, and therefore do I need to be made a presenter again? So th this is really just a plug for uh, um, up and coming webinars supported by CCIC. So uh, again, some math watering subjects using AI data and digitalization and chemistry using businesses. 
I wouldn't expect I would expect Andy might make an appearance in that one. Um, so this has been a really hot topic: the chemistry of personal protective equipment, um, an insight in how those things are, are made and their their, their properties. Um, and another related one there is the sense that actually we've generated a massive mountain of waste in the PPE industry at the moment. Uh, and so how on earth do you think through how to make single use PPE, not single use and renewable uh, or sustainable? It's, um, it's actually a very big challenge. Uh, not surprisingly, we, we've turned our minds to that in Unilever at the moment. Um, but uh, I think there are, it's, it's a, a mountainous problem from, from the waste point of view. Uh, and then, of course, chemistry is fundamentally important in, in drugs, drug development. Um, and so how do we think about chemistry in the context of health and well-being? Um, and then just a couple of lectures to plug. So 24th of June, Paul Hodges at Enter Business as Usual. How can UK chemists and companies become winners in a new landscape? Robert Harrison on the 9th of July, in the myths and realities of the manufacturing digital revolution. And then on 6th of August, Melanie Loveridge, why lithium ion batteries degrade and lose their capacity. The Eliad and, and the Odyssey for lithium ions or lions. So that's what's coming up. Um, I think it just remains to thank the organizers for putting the, the webinar together uh, and to, to thank every one of the speakers for a contribution. I think um, uh, I see from the, the chat and the comments that a lot of people have found the insights and the information very, very valuable. Um, and I think we will be able to make the, um, the material av available as, um, as PDF, I, I believe. So with that, once more, thanks for the speakers for their contribution and uh, we'll close there.